Now let's turn to the Word of God for tonight. Luke chapter 13, you'll find a copy right in front of you with your hymn book, a blue book. Luke chapter 13, verse 18 to the end of the chapter. Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it with? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. The plant grew and became a tree, and the birds made nests in its branches. Again Jesus asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God with? It is like the yeast which a woman takes and mixes in a bushel of flour until the whole batch of dough rises. Jesus went through towns and villages, teaching and making his way towards Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Sir, will just a few people be saved? Jesus answered them, Do your best to go in through the narrow door, because many people, I tell you, will try to go in but will not be able. The master of the house will get up and close the door. Then when you stand outside and begin to knock on the door and say, Open the door for us, sir, he will answer you, I don't know where you come from. Then you will answer back, we ate and drank with you, you taught in our town. He will say again, I don't know where you come from, get away from me, all you evildoers. What crying and gnashing of teeth there will be when you see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God while you are thrown out. People will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. Then those who are now last will be first, and those who are now first will be last. At that same time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, You must get out of here and go somewhere else, because Herod wants to kill you. Jesus answered them, Go tell that fox. I am driving out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow and on the third day I shall finish my work. Yet I must be on my way today, tomorrow, and the next day. It is not right for a prophet to be killed anywhere except in Jerusalem. 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 You kill the prophets. You stone the messengers God has sent you. How many times I wanted to put my arms round all your people just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you would not let me. Now your home will be completely forsaken. You will not see me, I tell you, until the time comes when you say, God bless him who comes. In the name of the Lord. It's amazing how widespread is the notion that Christianity has been a failure. People say it's been in the world 2,000 years and we're no better off. And people in this country particularly seeing churches turn into bing bingo halls and furniture stores and supermarkets feel that we're on the way out. So much so that in many places, if you mention that you're a Christian, you'll be looked at as if you came out of the ark. As a student up at the university said to me at the end of a talk I gave, do you still believe in Adam and Eve? As if that put me way back in the 17th or 18th century. And one businessman had the impudence to say to me, what's it feel like to belong to a dying organization? <laughs> I could only say I wouldn't know. Now, <laughs> there are those who feel that Christianity is on the way out, that in fact Christ has failed and that it's only a matter of time till it's a museum piece. I love the story of Voltaire, the French philosopher and scientist, who predicted during his lifetime that a hundred years after his death, the only place you would find a Bible would be in a museum. And his home in Paris, where he made that prediction, is now the depot of the British and Foreign Bible Society, <laughs> and thousands of scriptures go through it. Today's English version, which we are reading, only came out a few years ago, and yet already between 40 and 50 million copies of just the New Testament have been sold around the world, and it's just not stopping. 
And when the Old Testament joins it in 1975, I predict that this will be the Bible that will sweep ahead of the others. That's just a tip from the stable uh, to get ready. You can use the Living Bible at the moment for the whole Bible if uh, you're interested. And that, in fact, is the second uh, modern translation of this kind next to the today's English version. New English Bible is third. The Revised Standard Version as a translation of a group of scholars is, of course, still the bestseller of all since it came out in 1948. That adds up to something, doesn't it? But the real answer to those who feel that Christianity is on the way out lies in two very simple little picture stories which Jesus gave at the beginning of the reading we read. He said, how shall I describe the kingdom of God for you? How, how can I compare it? Because it's something so inconceivable that you've got to find some comparison. You've got to be able to say it's like this or like that. And it, I'm almost visualizing Jesus scratching his head and saying, what shall I compare it to? How can I get it across to you? How can I give you the feel of the kingdom of God? He said, I know. The kingdom of God is like a grain of mustard seed. Now, perhaps you've never seen that. I've got some at home somewhere. I don't think I'll ever find them again because they're so small you can hardly see them with the naked eye. When they rest in your hand, it's just like a bit of pollen, little black pollen, tiny little black specks. And locked inside every one of those specks is a tree that can be anywhere between 8 and 12 feet tall. Some of you will remember seeing one last May in Bethany, just outside that little church, and that was maybe about 10 feet tall. Tiny little seed and locked within it is the potential for a tree that's going to be big enough for the birds to come and nest in. And my, how those birds like a mustard tree because they love those little seeds in the pods and they will soon come and have a favorite perch in the tree. And Jesus says, that's the kingdom of God. All right, it looks small to you, does it? It looks a tiny thing. After all, when Jesus left this planet, he left behind him 11 men, 11 men, most of them pretty poorly educated. That's how it began, and that was the tiny mustard seed. 11 men in an obscure corner of the Roman Empire, of a despised nation, and that's how it started. And now, 2,000 years later, there are 500 million people in this world who acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. 500 million. You see, that little group of men was like a mustard seed and had within it the potential of a tree that the birds of the air could come and nest in. And if you study your Bible carefully, you'll find that the birds of the air is a phrase that is often used as a picture of the nations moving around the face of our globe, people from the east and the west and the north and the south. And this little group of men had within it the potential of including all those nations. And that's how it's happening. Now, Jesus was always one to bear in mind his whole audience. And when he gave a picture story like this, that was an outdoor story that would appeal to the men, he usually followed up with the same lesson in a picture story that would be an indoor story and appeal to the ladies. And so he immediately followed it up with another story. And he, he scratched his head again. And he said, how, how can I compare it for you ladies? Help you to understand. It's like a little bit of yeast that you put in a large lump of dough. And once again, that little bit of yeast has the potential in it to spread through the whole lump and, and affect it and change it. Just a little bit of yeast. Now, of course, they didn't buy yeast in those days. They baked their bread fresh every day. And what they did was this. They always kept just a little piece of the bread and let it ferment and go moldy. And that's what they used to leaven the next batch of baking bread. So there was always a little bit of moldy bread kept. That was the equivalent of yeast. That was the fermenting enzyme that they used in those days. And once a year they cleared the, cleared the whole pantry out just before the Passover and saw that no moldy bread was left in the house. They had a clean start once a year. One can think of some very obvious reasons at a practical level for doing that. It also was a symbol of clearing out everything that's moldy, and it became a symbol in the Christian gospel of clearing out every mold in your heart and leavening your hearts and being bewaring of the leaven of the Pharisees. But that's another story. So he took this picture of, of a kitchen, and he said, it's just like that. It'll spread right through the whole lump of dough. Now, there are certain things that Jesus is trying to get across about the kingdom to us, and I'll give you five that I can see in these two simple stories. 
Number one, the kingdom of God comes to our earth from outside the earth. It didn't start here. It has to come here. It has to be put into our society. It doesn't spring from man. No man can build the kingdom of God. It's beyond the human capacity to build utopia. We've tried again and again to create a new world for our kids, but we can't do it. It's got to come from outside. The kingdom of God has to be put in as that seed of mustard has to be put into the soil before it can do a thing, and as the yeast has to be put into the dough so when Jesus came to our planet, the kingdom of God was being planted in our society. It was being put in the soil, put in the dough. That's the first thing. The kingdom of God comes from outside. Second, the kingdom of God works from inside. That's why it is largely unnoticed. When you put a seed in the ground, you don't notice. Not at first. And even when you do see something, the growth is imperceptibly slow, and no one will turn aside to see it. I've never seen anybody standing watching a plant grow, have you? They may notice that it's a little bigger than it was, but it's not a sensational thing. It's working inside. The seed is working in the soil. The yeast is working in the dough, invisibly, working from inside. But nevertheless, the potential is enormous. Outside our home, there's a tarmac drive, and you know, there are snowdrops that have been left behind before it was tarmac, there are some snowdrop bulbs that have been left behind under the tarmac. And you know, the tarmac just cracks. Just cracks. Thick, solid tarmac that's had a steamroller on it, and it just cracks because there's a little snowdrop underneath. That's the kingdom of God. And nothing can stop it now. You put yeast in dough and leave that dough, and there's nothing can stop it leavening the whole lump. Put a seed in the soil, and there's nothing can stop it developing. You can concrete it over, and it'll split the concrete. A living thing has more strength than, than dead things. Up in the Shetland Islands, I remember there was one quarry for the best granite in England. There was quite a market for gravestones down um, in this country from Shetland and up there they had no machinery to get this granite out so do you know how they got it out the hardest granite in Britain some of the oldest rock in Britain they got it out by boring a row of holes and then hammering in a live twig a twig snapped off a branch off a tree and they would push the twig in and then pour drops of water onto the twig and that living twig would do this and split the hardest granite. And you would see it just crack right down in a straight line. And the kingdom of God is like this. It comes from outside. It works from inside. The third thing is this. I've already said it. You can't stop it. You can't stop it. Go down to Winchester to where King Canute placed his throne in the waves. By the way, it's a legend and totally untrue that he tried to stop the waves coming in. What he actually tried to do, if you know your history, is to prove that he hadn't the power to stop the waves. There were, th there were those who thought that King Canute was omnipotent and wanted him to, him to do impossible things. So to prove that he couldn't do impossible things, he put his chair in the waves and then he said, now I'll show you that I can't stop them. And that's the true story, if you're prepared to accept my word for it. But you could no more stop the kingdom of God than you can stop the waves of the shore the tide coming in. You can no more stop Christianity spreading than you can stop the sun rising. You just can't do it. The fourth thing that comes out of these two little stories about the kingdom of God is this. The spread is not very spectacular. No one would stop and look at it. Every now and again they may notice something has changed, but it is almost so imperceptible that this world that is longing for sensation will crowd after a man who can bend spoons but will not come and hear the gospel. And so the world looking for sensation doesn't realize the kingdom of God is growing at the rate it is. The world is shattered to be told that 500 million people on our planet acknowledge Jesus Christ. They don't notice it. They don't want to notice it. It's almost imperceptible. But as I talk to you, Hundreds of lives are being changed in our world by the Lord Jesus Christ. The world's not interested and doesn't notice. It's like the seed growing and the yeast working. The next thing I notice about the kingdom of God is this. The end product is out of all proportion to the beginning. If the beginning was a handful of 11 men, it was originally 12, but one of those was a dud and it got down to 11. 
If the beginning was a leaven, the last end, the last product of it all, will be a company, a multitude that no man can count. A huge number. The kingdom of God is going to be huge. Huge. It's already many, many millions. And it's going to be many, many more. And finally, I would just point out that one day the kingdom will be complete. It won't be a bitty thing. The yeast leavens the whole lump of dough, and the mustard seed will go on growing until the tree is full height, and the kingdom of God will go on growing and spreading until God has everybody he wants in it, until people from every kindred and tribe and tongue are sitting down in that kingdom, until the nations have come from east and west and north and south and sat down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the prophets. It's got to go on until it's complete and until the kingdom of God has all the citizens in it that God wants. Now, do you find that exciting? It's great to know that this is the only kingdom that is like this. Of course, it's not so spectacular as things that happen in the world. It's not so spectacular as a revolution and one party overthrowing another. It's not as spectacular as the liberal revival that we're seeing just at the moment, and that's not a hint how to vote, but <laughs> it's not as spectacular as that. There isn't a single paper this week will have a headline in it saying the kingdom of God is growing and has been growing for 2,000 years. You won't see that. But I tell you, it's the most lasting thing that will happen this week. And when the liberals are forgotten and the Tories and the labor, when they've vanished in the dusts of time, the kingdom of God will be there. So I know which I'd rather belong to. Well, now that's what Jesus said. And today the kingdom is growing at the rate of about 25,000 a day. That's the rate of growth of people entering the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to belong to that kingdom. Now the second thing that we've got to say tonight is this. Your opportunity to enter that kingdom is decreasing. If the kingdom itself is increasing, your opportunity to get into it is decreasing. As it gets bigger, the door closes. And one day the door will shut. God has already marked the date on his calendar when he is going to close the door into the kingdom. Now this arose because somebody came up to Jesus when Jesus was making these fantastic claims about the huge growth of the kingdom that was going to be so large that nations would come to it as birds come to the mustard tree. And somebody came up and said, Lord, how many are you getting saved then? It's rather few, isn't it? I know that they said it in that tone of voice. You know, it's amazing how people will discuss everybody's salvation but their own. As we saw this morning in studying the beginning of chapter 13, people like to talk about other people's deaths, but they will never talk about their own. They read murder novels, they look into the paper headlines, and they, they take a kind of gowlish interest and have a morbid curiosity in the latest train crash or the latest bomb outrage. Funnily enough, we seem to enjoy talking about other people's deaths, but we'll never discuss our own. And so when somebody came to Jesus, as we saw this morning, and discussed a disaster a building that had fallen and killed 18 people, and were wanting to talk about it to Jesus, Jesus said, you just think about your own disaster, your own death. And so here, when somebody says, Jesus, how many converts are you getting? You're publishing the numbers of inquirers yet? Jesus said, you just make jolly sure that you're one of them. That's what he's saying. Some people are interested in a detached way in growing numbers, attending church, and the tide in this country has turned about two years ago. Mark my words, we will see more people turning to God in the next few years. Praise God for that. There's hope for our nation if that happens. But people are very interested in statistics. But if somebody says, how many converts, how many people, the answer is, you just make sure that you're one of them. Lord, is it going to be few or many? you make sure you're one of them. If you want to count the number of people entering the kingdom, the best place to count them is from inside. You strive to enter in that narrow door, get in among them, then you can count them. 
But if you're just interested in statistics or if you're trying to say that I haven't managed many converts yet, of course at this stage Jesus didn't have many followers. And somebody could ridicule what he was trying to do. He was only busy for three years in public ministry and then he was assassinated and just left those 11 men and anybody could have said, Lord, there are very few. You're not making much headway, are you? But Jesus' reply comes down echoing through the centuries. You just make sure that you're among them before the door shuts. Very sobering thought that it's going to shut. I heard of a Sunday school teacher who was telephoned by a man who was known to be dying of cancer. And this man who was dying of cancer said to the Sunday school teacher, tell me about Christianity. And the Sunday school teacher's heart leapt and thought, I, I can help this man. And so he, he talked to this man over the phone and told him what Christianity was all about. And then he said, may I come around and see you? I'll gladly call and discuss it further. And the man said, no thanks. He said, I, I was just curious. I was just curious. He just wanted to hear a bit about Christianity. He wasn't the slightest concerned about himself. And the poor Sunday school teacher's heart fell. And all people are interested in what we do. I remember when I was a chaplain in the RAF. And... Um, the number of young recruits to the RAF was growing, coming to the church, and, and a wing commander came to him and said, good for the boys, this. More prayers you have, the better. <laughs> and that's how he talked. I went to an army camp in Arabia and fell for it the first time. The CO of the camp said to me, uh, now, Padre, you want a service, do you? I said, yes. He said, how many do you want at the service? <laughs> so, <laughs> with my tongue in my cheek, I said, a couple of hundred. When I got there, there were 200 men, precisely, <laughs> sitting in the rows. But not one officer, and not this CO. So the next time I visited that camp on the south coast of Arabia, he said the same thing. He said, how many do you want at the service? I said, you get the officers there, and I'll go around and invite the men, all right? You see, it's so easy to be glad that other people are getting religious, to be glad that these young people are getting sensible ideas. But what about you? Lord, are there few that be saved? You get in. You be one of the few. Because it's a narrow door. You can't get much through except yourself. You'll have to leave your pride behind. You'll have to leave your sins behind. They're too wide to get through that door. It's a narrow door. You agonize to get in, says Jesus, hinting that it's not always easy to become a Christian. It's sometimes a struggle, a battle. It's an agony. You've got to fight. But he said, you make sure, make it your top priority. Make every effort agonize to get in. Because one day the door will be shut and you'll be outside. Which brings me to the sober truth, which is often denied today, that Jesus said the kingdom will not be open forever. There's a new heresy creeping around, even in Christian circles, called universalism. And it argues something like this. If God is love and he loves us, he will never shut the door. And surely when we all get to hell, we'll be so anxious to get to heaven, he'll let us come and there'll be a second chance after death. And surely God's love is the most powerful thing in the universe. And therefore it can't fail and therefore he must get all of us into heaven. Have you heard that kind of talk? I tell you this, Jesus never talked that way. He even said that when people get to hell, they will want to get to heaven. They will want to get to heaven. That there will come a day when people plead with God to let them in, and God says, no, I gave you an opportunity, and the door's shut. Somebody has defined hell as the place where truth is known too late. The place where truth is known too late. And I suppose the two saddest phrases in the English language are one, too late, and two, shut out. One of the worst things about hell is that you can see heaven from there. And whenever Jesus spoke of hell, he used the word Gehenna, which is a geographical name, from a deep, dark valley on the south and west sides of the city of Jerusalem. It's so deep that at one point the sun never touches the, the valley bottom. It's down there that Judas hanged himself. As the Bible says, he went to his own place. And in that valley, you look up a sharp escarpment, and right on the top you can see the towering walls of the temple and Jerusalem. And Jesus said, that's what hell is like, to know what you've missed, and to know that it's your responsibility and yours alone, and that you're there by your choice. 
because you had an opportunity when the door was open and you wouldn't take it. And now the door is shut. And the frustration and the anger, he says, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever seen a person really so bitter and so angry with themselves that they missed an opportunity and knew that it could never come again? That's hell. That's how Jesus painted it. And that is the tragedy of hundreds and thousands of people within a mile or two of us. And the door is open at the moment and God is saying the kingdom is yours. Repent and believe. Come right in. Strive to enter in. Agonize to get in. Get in if you possibly can now. Because when it's too late there's nothing can be done. We shall get many surprises, you know, when we get to the other side of life. There'll be some not there that we expected to be there. There'll be some very important people in this world who won't be there. There will be many politicians not there who have led millions of people. There'll be pop stars that youngsters have worshipped and they'll not be there. It's rather sad to see the kind of worship that's offered to men who will just not be in the next world. Unless there's a radical change. Do you remember that day that John Lennon said that the Beatles were more famous than Jesus Christ? Do you remember that day? I trembled when he said that. And you know their decline began that day. For he said it in the presence of the one to whom all authority in heaven and earth is given. And the Lord is a jealous Lord and he will not share his glory with another. And he won't stand for things like that. And they're now out on limbo. They don't know where they are. They don't know what to do. They've lost their purpose in life. And they're arguing among themselves. Oh, one trembles. For those who've had adulation in this world, those who've been at the top of their career in this world, those who've built up a great business in this world, those who've had a big bank balance in this world, those whom this world regards as great and important people. And Jesus says there's going to be an awful big surprise when you get there. The least will be first and the, the first last. And there's going to be a great upside down. And people that have been insignificant and unnoticed here will be the important people there. Oh, strive to enter in. Make sure you're there. And so that's the second thing I want to say tonight. My first point was the spreading kingdom, but my second point was the closing door. Third thing I want to say is about the resisting city. Jesus was now in Perea, which is a strip of land on the east side of the Jordan, down in the deep valley, and he was right at the spot where John the Baptist, his own cousin, had been arrested and taken to that castle overlooking the Dead Sea, that rock fortress of Machaerus, where in the dungeon John the Baptist languished until finally, at the wish of a dancing girl, his head was chopped off. And now Jesus was in the very spot where John the Baptist was arrested. And Herod was king over that area. And Herod was scared of another John the Baptist. He was still very uneasy in his conscience about John. And so Herod schemed and he got hold of some Pharisees, people he normally wasn't on speaking terms with, the religious leaders. And he said, look, I want that man out of my territory. He's a menace. I want him to go. Go and frighten him. Tell him I'm going to kill him, but get him out of the country. Get him to run away back to the north in Galilee. And so these Pharisees came and pretended to be his friends and pretended to want to help Jesus. And they said, Jesus, here's a tip. You get out of here because Herod's going to kill you. We want to help you. We want you to live. And Jesus spoke to a king and said, Go and tell that fox I'm staying right here until my work is finished. Once again, our nice little sentimental picture of Jesus suffers a bit of a shock. The Jesus we think always said nice things about people and was always tactful and courteous. Here's Jesus saying, go and tell that fox. Now that's a big insult in the Middle East. A fox is a sly, cunning creature, but it's a little creature. It's a tiny little creature and, and it's saying you're neither straight nor great. You're just a sly little fox and I'm not scared of you. Go and tell that fox. What an insult. But Jesus was speaking the truth that Herod was no more than a little cunning fox. So Jesus called him what he was. You know, Christians have had great boldness in the spirit of Jesus to speak to kings. Latimer was a very great Christian man who preached in Westminster Abbey one day, and it was when Britain was very tense. England was in a very tense situation over religion. It was during the days of King Henry VIII, and Henry VIII was a bit of a tyrant, as you know, and changed his mind 
and did all sorts of things in religious matters. And he got into the pulpit and he looked down and there was King Henry VIII in Westminster Abbey in the pew and Latimer was preaching. And Latimer was about to begin his sermon and he said this at the beginning of his sermon. He said, Latimer, Latimer, be careful what you say. The King of England is here. And then he paused and then he said, Latimer, Latimer, be careful what you say. The King of Kings is here. Men like that paid for it in a very costly way. But here's Jesus going to a king and saying, Fox, you're just a little foxy person. And you know, later, some months later, when Jesus stood before Herod and Herod rubbed his hands and said, now let's see some of your tricks. He was regarding Jesus as the Uri Geller of his day. And he said, now let's see some of your tricks. Come on, I've heard you can do wonderful things. Do some for me. Let's see how you do them. And you know that Jesus had not one word to say to Herod? How would you like to be in the spiritual condition in which the Lord Jesus has nothing to say to you? Nothing. You can't talk to a fox. So Jesus, with wonderful faith in his Father, said, Look, I'm not scared of you. I'm not going to be deflected from God's plan for me. I've got people to save right here in your territory. I've got to cast out demons. I've got to perform cures. And I have already my life mapped out for me and I shall be here for a few days more and I've got to finish my work and then I'm going to Jerusalem and you will not have the privilege of killing me. Jerusalem has first claim on prophet's blood. Pretty sarcastic thing to say that, but that's what Jesus was saying. Herod, you're thinking yourself a bit big if you want to kill me. It's Jerusalem that must have the honor. They've killed every other prophet. That's where I should go. What a way to talk to a king. But behind it all is this sublime faith in God the Father, knowing that God had the times of Jesus in his hand. And you could say that too, you know. God knows the day you're going to die. Isn't it lovely just to be quite sure I'm going to live long enough to do what God wants me to do? Then he can take me. To know that your life has been mapped out and that if you keep in the center of God's will, nobody can spoil that plan. Nobody can bring it to an untimely end. My times are in his hand. And so Jesus went to Jerusalem, to that city that he loved. Sorry I keep mentioning our trip to Israel last May. I, I don't intend to make you break the Tenth Commandment, but it, if ever you can, go, go. But we arrived in the city of Jerusalem in pitch darkness late one night last May, and, and we went to our beds. And then in the morning we got up and went to the dining room, which was on the top floor of the hotel, not the bottom, the top, all the bedrooms were on the, below. And we went up to that dining room, which had windows, picture windows, on all four sides. And it was on top of the Mount of Olives. And from one window, we could look down to Jericho and the Dead Sea in the hills of Moab, 15 miles away. From another window, we could look across to Bethlehem and the hills beyond leading to Hebron. In the other direction, we could look at the Mount of Olives and the place where our Lord ascended and just a little below Gethsemane. So we had our breakfast just looking out, but on this side, never forget it, will we? We looked out while we had our breakfast. There before us was the golden city of Jerusalem. Its limestone buildings gleaming in the sun. The golden dome of the rock glistening. And there it lay, spread before us while we had our breakfast. And Jesus saw that city. And he wept over it. He wept. The city that was going to kill him. The people who were going to assassinate him at the age of 33. And he wept over it and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now you see how his mind is thinking. He's just been talking to a fox, so now he sees himself as a hen. You see the connection? Herod was supposed to be the king of the Jews, or at least a part of the Jewish nation. And he was a fox. But Jesus, again with that lovely mind of his that could see pictures in so much could take a little everyday scene and, and fill it with spiritual meaning. Have you ever seen a hen gather her chicks and rustle up her feathers and, and the chicks disappear? Have you seen this? And you think there's only a hen there and all the chicks are inside. 
they're protected, they're in the hen. It's a lovely sign, and then you just see a little beak peek out. And Jesus said, oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, you've got rulers over you at the moment who are foxes, but I'm a hen. And I have longed so often to gather you under my wings and to cuddle you, to have you in me so that nothing could touch you. Be warm and safe. And now I give you a literal translation of what he said. I was willing to do this, but you willed not. You willed not. In other words, there was a clash between Jesus' will and Jerusalem's will. And the greatest power that God has given me, the very greatest power that God has given me, is to say no to Jesus. And I have that power. And God so loves me that he respects my freedom, and the one thing that God will never do is force his will on me, if I will not. That is why he will not get everybody to heaven. That's why there is such a place as hell and why there will be many who will go there. It is not that God's love is lacking. It is that he respects us as human beings. And he says, if you will not, I will not. How often would I have gathered you and you would not? As a parent said to me, I feel I have strong willpower, but my child seems to have a stronger won't power. And that's how God must speak of us. Here is the tragedy, that the one city of the world that could have been the capital city of his kingdom, the city that he had chosen for his throne, and the city that one day he will have his throne in, the city of Jerusalem, that city that once you've been, you feel that's my home, that's where my heart belongs, that's where I really look to. Jerusalem, the very name rings of the king of peace, Jerusalem. Your heart goes out to it. That city would not, would not. And so the kingdom was not established in that city. And Jesus wept for them and said, do you realize what this means? To reject me means ruin. I can see this lovely temple, your house, left desolate because God would, f would finish with it. Do you know when Jesus died, killed at 33, when he died, the gorgeous temple veil that hung over the Holy of Holies, a, a curtain many feet high, perhaps 40 feet high, gorgeously embroidered, it was ripped from the top to the bottom by unseen hands, not from the bottom to the top, not by human hands, it was ripped open and when they looked into the Holy of Holies it was empty and bare. God had gone, your house desolate. And he said, you won't see me again until I come back as king and you say, God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you know that one day Jesus is going to come to Jerusalem as king and they will bless him for it. That's the most exciting thing. But oh, these 2,000 years that they've been ruined. These 2,000 years they've been hounded around the world. These 2,000 years they've been murdered and slaughtered. I was in Jerusalem for the trial of Adolf Eichmann, accused of murdering six million of them. Ruin comes to those who reject. So I finish tonight's message by saying two things. Number one, you can't stop the kingdom of God. You can't stop it. There is nothing you can do to stop it. The only thing you can do is to stop yourself entering it. That's the only thing. Which means that if you are outside it, it is no one's fault but your own. You have willed not to enter. But praise God, the door of the kingdom is still open tonight. And Christ is still weeping. When Jesus came to Golgotha, they nailed him to a tree. They drove great nails through hands and feet and made a calvary. They crowned him with a crown of thorns. Red were his wounds and deep. For those were crude and cruel days. 
and human flesh was cheap. When Jesus came to Birmingham, they simply passed him by. They wouldn't hurt a hair of him. They only let him die. They passed him by unheeding and left him in the rain. Sorry, for men had grown more tender and they would not give him pain. They passed him by unheeding and left him in the rain. Still Jesus cried, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And still it rained, the wintry rain that drenched him through and through. The crowds went home without a soul to see that Jesus leant against the wall and cried for Calvary. Let us pray. There are people here in this congregation tonight over whom Jesus has wept and said, how often would I have gathered that person, that young man, that girl, that older man, that older woman, how often would I have gathered him, her, under my wings? And he would not, and she would not. The door is still open tonight. Repent of your sins. Believe that Christ died for you as Savior and rose again to be your Lord. And the gates of the kingdom of heaven are wide open to you. Strive to enter in before the master of the house shuts the door. Amen. Going to change the last hymn, if I may. 706. 706, the first tune. So be it, Lord, thy throne shall never, like earth's proud empires, pass away, but stand and rule and grow forever till all thy creatures own thy sway. 706. Mm -hmm.